And I'm gonna drop I'm gonna drop in the chat the mobile check-in link. So if you could check in, hopefully that works. And Robert, go ahead and share yeah. your wisdom. This is uh, going to be pretty informal in that uh, I was actually expecting to follow up the previous presentation uh, and then the, that didn't happen. So I don't have anything to follow up. Uh, so that was a, it's a uh, interesting turn of events. That being said, I'm going to drop in the chat these two that I have uh, custom GBTs that I have already built. Just in case you wanted to use them, uh, they have already been programmed in ways that I'm going to show you that I did today. Um, but uh, for instance, the OER and licensing that is specific to finding OER text and doing asking licensing questions, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, and the second one is the one you may be interested in because it is programmed to follow AQ, U, uh, UDL, and tilt principles. So you can give it assignments and ask for it to then generate new versions of those assignments, say, already tilted for you, and it can do that. Um, that being said, I'm going to share my screen so, and show you the sort of front side of this. I will say, um, to create custom GPTs like I'm going to show you, you do have to pay. There's no... Uh, other way around that. That being said, once they are built, you can give them to anyone for free. They are uh, so it's not it doesn't charge anyone to use them. You just have to have paid to build them. Um, and if you want infinite uses, you also have to pay a little bit. That being said, uh, I built these two specifically uh, for uh, these tasks that they are named for. And I was just going to show sort of the rules and how I went about creating its knowledge base uh, to get what I wanted out of it. Because um, as Kirsten was talking about, and Kirsten, you can also speak to this and anyone else too. If, uh, this is more of a workshop than a presentation. Um, but she couldn't really get even chat GBT 4.0 to make sensible uh, comments or to give actual to create documents that she could actually use. Um, because it's just not smart enough. Uh, it's a kind of a dumb tool if you don't tell it what to do. Sorry, I'm trying to let make it let me make that bigger, but it won't let me make it bigger. Oh, there it is. So this is sort of my framework and I use these frames to create rules for these chatbots to specifically only look for uh, specific kinds of information, only provide specific kinds of responses that I'm looking for in relation to this material. <clears throat> so uh, I start here with telling it who it is. I define what it, uh, who it is and what it's for. Uh, and here I try to identify its primary audience. So uh, this is who it is. This is where I tell it its tone, and this is where I've told it its audience in basic terms. Um, that sort of gets the ball rolling as far as its tone and diction goes, uh, but then I start to create its rules. Uh, number one rule is understanding OER and open educational resources, tells it, defines it, gives it a quote, uh, and talks about creative, and then goes on to number two, which is the Creative Commons licenses, defines all of what those are, um, and gives an example response of how it should respond when people ask questions in relation to those Creative Commons rules. Um, then I gave it a little script on choosing the right license. Sorry for the uh, corrections there. Uh, for creating, uh, choosing the right license when someone asks, what kind of license should I use? How to use proper attributions, uh, guidance and remixing. And so these are all based on my own notes and uh, going through and telling it, okay, these are the responses that uh, I'm looking for and how you should respond in each of these scenarios. I will say initially, this does take quite some time to think through You know, all these different rules. I did base it off of someone else's uh, uh, someone else's engineering as well. I took their sort of framework and then rebuilt my rules around their framework. So I didn't do it from scratch. So I would point out too, is I, I will also share out the uh, set of these rule sets. And then you can actually give that to ChatGPT. Hey, here is how I want you to structure a rule set. 
this is what I want you to do it with though. So I don't want you to do OER and licensing. I want you to do uh, creating documents and tilt or responding to students with syllabi, which is something that I'm gonna do in a, just a little bit. Um, so these, uh, the beauty of these is once you have one, you can actually use uh, a generator to help redefine that same uh, different rule sets with that same structure. Uh, if that makes sense. And if I am talking too fast, please let me know. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to stop sharing. I meant to stop uh, using that one. And then this isn't necessary, but uh, because I was trying to build this to be front facing, I did give it some conversation starters, questions that it should ask uh, people who are talking to it to try to uh, get them to ask the right questions so it can generate good responses. Uh, but this is specifically if you are, uh, because I'm giving it to people that I don't know how they're going to use it. Uh, so for instance, if I'm building a bot for myself, I wouldn't need to do this uh, because I don't need it to ask me questions. Um, but if you are, say, going to give it to students, which is something I'm going to maybe recommend later, uh, that would be something you might want to do. That being said, really where the magic starts to happen is in the knowledge section. So this is where I've specifically given it my work or other work uh, that is the knowledge base that I want it to pull from. So it's not pulling from the web. It's not pulling from random websites or blogs, which is what it would do naturally, right? If it's just uh, of the 4.0. I'm specifically giving it fair use laws. Uh, I know they're weirdly numbered PDFs, but these are PDFs from TBR based on OER, how to properly attribute the Teach Act, uh, and all these different things that you would need to know to properly understand licensing and OER, et cetera. Um, so I've dictated its knowledge, and this is really what makes it effective. Um, and going down here to some advanced settings, this is where I've actually turned off. It can't even go to the web to browse. So this is it literally can only use the knowledge that I've given it, and that's going to be important later. Uh, and one that is buried that is also really important, especially for our recording, if you're going to build one and give these to someone else. I recommend hitting this little arrow that says additional settings down here because it allows you to turn off them using the conversation as data. It has to be off, or it has to be here to turn it off, but they bury it so that you can't really see it. Uh, so you have to click this little arrow to even be able to see that it's there. It's the only one under that arrow. Uh, so obviously they are trying to hide it, but... Uh, you can't find it there. So looking at the Classroom Innovator, this is the second one, and I think maybe perhaps the more useful, at least uh, unless you are looking for OER, of course, is uh, this one on UDL principles. And so this one is a little bit different because, again, this one's a, I expected more people to want to use this one. Uh, so I gave it uh, an awareness phase and some chatbot responses with some personality that I wanted to, to be a little bit more personable. Um, talked about the teaching strategies that I wanted to use, some example dialogue here. And so this rule set is basically, this one is built around how I want it to talk to uh, people who are using it and the rules and ways that it should res respond, specifically because, again, I've controlled its knowledge, so I know what it's going to be answering with through that section. So I was less worried about providing actual rule sets in here. I was more worried about um, how I thought people might want to use it. Um, and some uh, prompting questions to help them with generating better uh, instructional content based on universal design for learning, TILT, and AQ. When you say you fed it the like AQ, like what principles or what, how much of AQ, like what did you actually give it? Yeah, okay. so we can see down here. And so this is a, this one has a lot more knowledge in it. Um, uh -huh. Some of these are my notes, so it just says presenters' notes on so. So this would be some of my in, some of our in services, for instance, uh, that we've got given before. Uh, st the strategic planning works, uh, UDL graphic organizers. Uh, let's see where was the. So this well, is the like UDL LAC. guidelines. 
or yeah. some so, yeah. the AQ, right? Yeah. Right. And so then you can, I, I've specifically given it this on how to provide effective feedback and how to create uh, effective discussions, which we, we just went through on the online uh, uh, institute. Uh, right. um, and so all of this is very specific uh, information that I've given it sort of as its brain. So like it, this is its memory and its knowledge and the only thing that it can pull from. So then when I give it an assignment and I say, how would I tilt this? It'll just spit the tilted assignment out. Um, or how would I redesign this using UDL? It will just A, explain how to do it, and then B, give you an example of what it would have done um, using that knowledge. This I did allow web browsing specifically because I'm asking it to pull in its constraints from the knowledge first. The reason I allowed for web browsing is uh, so that it could go and find things from uh, AQ, UDL, et cetera, um, in case I've missed something in a sense. <laughs> Uh, but it has constraints inside of the rule sets here that would that, uh, specifically tell it to go to the knowledge first and then to the web only as a supplemental uh, constraint. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, no. And again, I'll put I'll provide these rules in a Word document for anyone who wants them uh, to them. Okay. Can you even back up a step to where, um, so if you were like going onto a new tab and like exactly like how did you get to the screen where you could configure this bot or this, you know, AI within chat? So, yeah, you can see here, I have a, quite a few, um, but we would just go right, uh, not in chat. We go to explore GBTs, and then right here, there's going to be a button for create. Okay. Um, and so you have like my GBTs, which is where mine are. And then uh, if I want to create a new one, which we are going to do, I would go here and hit create. So this is, for instance, a way that I think this can be really good for students as well. Um, we'll just call this uh, like a type, the syllabi, because we all know how often they read them. <laughs> like never. Yeah. yeah. So I can then unselect web browsing, no Dolly image generation. Uh, oh, I have to, you have to create its actions first. Um, and then I'm going to go in here before I do the rules and I'm going to upload some files. This is going to be its brain, right? And I'm just going to go, hey, these are my syllabuses. Syllabi? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> English professor. <laughs> Should have got that right. Uh, <laughs> or uh this semester and i'm just going to say there are my syllabi and i'm going to go back here to well i'm actually going to use my other rule sets let's see classroom innovator and i'm going to grab my conversation here and i'm just going to ask it to And then based on that, it's going to reconfigure student facing. And again, the reason that this one would be good at that is because it already understands uh, students, how to do the discussions, et cetera. So it's pulling from all that AQ data and all that UDL data that I've given this specific bot to generate these new commands. Yeah, so I can see how you're building the knowledge base that's you, right, into this tool that can then create different texts for you using these different principles and rules. Right, and so then I'll take these rules over here and I'll tell, okay, this is how you respond to students, uh, conversation starters. So a GPT is kind of the same as like a chat bot because they're all asking for conversation options. Is that right? In a sense, it, yeah, it's a it's a siloed uh, chat bot. 
And so, um, sorry, I'm having trouble coming up with good questions. If you think of any, let me know. Um, and so these would be the kind of questions that would pop up here on the screen so that I would then provide this as a link to my students. Um, they could access this access this 24 seven, ask it any questions about the syllabi, the grading, et cetera. Um, so if I just go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and create this so that we can test it. Although I should have put my uh, portfolio system in there for the English 1010, I guess. Say mm. lobby. Well, you can always go back and edit, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh -oh. So you can see here, it starts out. Uh, I'm trying to think in my film class. And it'll let them know this is how much the points were worth, uh, how much the total was. Um, and it'll let them know what to do. So again, it's not gonna be perfect. It's only gonna be as good as the knowledge I give it. I can then go and fine tune it if it's not giving me the right responses that I want or students give me feedback that it you know, uh, gave them a wrong response or something, I can go in and try to fix that. Uh, but this is a way that A, it's safe because you're not feeding any data back. You don't have to worry about you know them using the chats uh, from your students. You can restrict its knowledge to only what you want it to say and only what, only what you want it to read. And if you do it that way, uh, for instance, this could have all the English though by in it. Uh, it could read all of them together. Um, and there could be one master chat for like all the English syllabi that you then uh, just have in a course shell and it would work the same way. I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just saying it can work that way that multiple, you can have multiple courses into one. You can have uh, multiple departments even. Um, at one point, I would say they do, the more you stretch it, the more the responses uh, become nonsense. And so this, I think, uh, Kirsten, for instance, is why you get, nonsense back is because it's trying to do it's unrestricted so it's trying to do everything and it's pulling from everywhere and so it just comes back with nonsense um whereas if i give it like a very specific task and a very specific set of data and what it's and tell it what it's supposed to do then it can function pretty well and uh be a pretty productive tool in these ways um and i don't know if this has been overly helpful <laughs> uh let me know if you have questions or uh, stuff that I can help show you or work with. This is just an example here that I built doing the syllabi, uh, but I can help do a different one. I will say a little bit of a shout out. This is a live one that I built uh, for our uh, teaching center webpage. Oh, sorry, I have to, I only have the editing page now. But you can also get help with OER if you want. Uh, you can show that to anybody. So uh, once it loads, it's a little green chat bot on the bottom of our OER webpage. Uh, and it's much more intelligent, um, mostly because I can give it a lot more stuff to work with. Uh, but this one is also, I did have to also pay for this one. And you can see here that the rules are quite extensive. Well, that one's not loading. So I'll put that in a link when it, uh, when it loads. Uh, so uh, were there any questions or thoughts or things I can help with? I'm not an AI expert by any. Um, working with like a, a particular assignment in class, like, um, you know, to maybe to help students navigate through proper usage of AI as a, as a learning tool um ai teaching about how to use ai ethically <laughs> yeah or yeah like um and also how much did this cost you like to just to is it uh 
um the, so subscription or do you have to pay monthly or you know just for yeah it's it's monthly it was, i think it was like 20 bucks yeah the chat gpt4 um i just i just opted for the subscription as well it's 21 something with tax so yeah 20 bucks a month which you know i i was playing with it anyway <laughs> uh so that was a personal decision to uh to think of that Uh, mostly everyone's asking about it. So I figured I should uh, know what was going on. Yeah. And I decided to pay for the subscription. Um, my husband is an IT person and he's been using it in coding and in his work. And he's just been raving about how helpful it is with a lot of tasks that he has to do, speeding up his work. And then um you know, I'm I'm playing with it as well, trying to see how it can help me with my tasks, right? And um, so you get more, um, like you are limited if you're in the free one, you can only like ask so many questions before it's like, no, your time's up. So this, by, by paying for the subscription, obviously I can ask all sorts of different questions and queries and things. And then um, you obviously have, just more access to creating and, and building things like Robert's showing. So there's a lot of functionality. Like um, actually, if you pay for it, you get the Dolly, which is the picture or visual creator that's not available in the free version. So you can't make any AI pictures unless you pay for the subscription, for example. Well, I, I would personally say that's like its weakest attribute. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it doesn't make good pictures. <laughs> There, like, uh, like it can't, it cannot. Even if you tell it the words to put in the picture, it still can't put words in a picture. But yeah, I haven't played with it much, but um, I was trying I mean, to on the free version, and it's like, oh, they took that away for a little while. You could, and then Dolly became embedded inside of the paid AI. So, Kirsten, uh, so like, is... what are what were some examples of you using it to help you as? Yeah, so for, for you for creating assignments, I mean, I'm yeah. just curious about that side, like how, you know, like professionals are, I mean, we're professionals, but people are using it to help them in their workplace. Like, how do you think it will benefit us as far as assignment creation? Yeah, so one of the things was, you know, I have, uh, I teach, you know, intro to education, I'm doing it virtually. So I'm, um I'm going over my PowerPoint, thinking about, you know, what, what activities do I want to do with my class? And I realized I had a video and in the past I've, I've given them, you know, maybe in the chat or on a document or something saying, here are some questions to think about. This is what I want you to take away from the video. We'd watch the video. I'd ask students to discuss it afterwards. And they were not even getting like the main idea. And it's like, how can you like not tell me what the main idea of this video is? It was, you know, like three to five minutes. It was repeated. And I'm like, so what I'm doing is not effective, right? So what what else can I do? So I and I'm also it's like a half an hour before class. And I'm like, oh, man, if I could just get some multiple choice questions, you know, about this video. And I'm like, aha, I was in a recent workshop that said an AI could do this for me. And um, it's so magic school. Um, Christy Ferguson did a little presentation for our BAPS uh, division in the spring. And magic school is a free AI interface, if you will. It's, it is using, I think, chat GPT. But if you get your free account at magicschool.ai, you can take a URL of a video from YouTube drop it into the spot in magic school and tell it that you want multiple choice questions or fill in the blank or open-ended or whatever. And it'll go through and it'll watch the video and it will come out with, and I asked for five multiple choice questions. Um, three of them were what I was kind of looking for. A couple were too simple fact based that, you know, I wanted a, a higher order question kind of thing. Um, but I can ask it to ask more or create more or using Bloom's levels, rewrite, you know, and give me these. So, I, I, and it happened really quickly. I got my five questions. I put it into a PowerPoint slide and I made it into a quiz where the students put into chat what they thought the answers were to the multiple choice questions. 
And I did that within a half an hour of class. And it was way more successful. The students actually did answer correctly the main ideas from the video through the multiple choice quiz rather than my open ended, hey, let's talk about this after you've watched it. So that was something that just happened like uh, last week or the week before. So. Hi, I just want to ask a quick question. I, I heard about this uh, this particular application just yesterday, and uh, you said that you used a video URL. I'm assuming that you could easily do that with a PowerPoint presentation. Is that correct? Yes. So I was going to uh, show I was going to show two things, um, and and so essentially, yes, you can. And I've I've been doing this not for uh, students, but for our teaching center hub, actually, where I've been taking past presentations and then the transcript from YouTube videos and having it generate how to guides. Um, and that was pretty effective. Um, so it definitely can read them and use them. And so like, if you have content and I've actually used that as well, I was going to say here, uh, uh, to also answer, uh, uh, Lita's question, um, as well, this used to look really different for my class before um and i could i don't want to pull it up because it takes forever to load uh where this was all very disorganized i had like six explorative assignments and it was uh uh kind of all over the place and i simply gave it all that same work and i was like hey i need to reorganize this into pre-production production and post-production phases i need you to make this sure the assignments fit those stages of production and uh correlate that with their actual stages of production of their uh film and this is what it spit out so essentially this was written i mean it's my work it was all my words but it was all reorganized and rewritten by the ai to put it into this new schedule and then created uh this h5 book wherein they can go and see, oh, those are the things I'm supposed to do. And I would argue is much better uh, than say, uh, as an example, kind of what it used to look like would be something more like this, but they were all on separate uh, pages. Yeah, and so. I, I would add into that. I think the, the benefit I've seen, and one of the things my husband's said as well is, if you've, if you've got some data in one format and you want it to be reorganized differently, this is the, the kind of thing where it can easily spit out a bar chart or a pie chart or put it in, you know, an outline. And in fact, I just, I just used it to, so I had um, done a presentation yesterday on a sort of a book review of um, an Adam Grant book called The Hidden Potential. So as I read that book, I had taken notes and I just kind of had bullet points, right? Like I'm reading going, yeah, great idea, great idea, great idea. And then I'm like, okay, now I have to present on it. I actually have these four themes. So I told the AI to give me a presentation and use these notes and put them into the four themes for me. So it sorted my bullet points into my categories. Now, it wasn't perfect because one of my categories was a learning process and it put things that I thought were learning in a different category heading, but it saved me time and it definitely made it easier for me to edit by going from my original to the AI version of the outline and then I created another outline from that. So it did speed up the organization process of a presentation that I wanted to give, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so this is like one of those that we're talking about. This was based on a presentation that someone else gave. They gave me their PowerPoints and their notes, and I just stuck it in my uh, class innovator, which you're free to take and use, of course, with that link. Uh, and this is literally exactly what it gave me, uh, all repackaged uh, for easy use. Yeah, in, okay. in D2L, right? So you're now, this is what the D2L shell looks like having used the information created from the AI, right? And this is all repackaged uh, from, uh, again, PowerPoints, et cetera. And so I would also say too, that's the fun part is uh, kind of where all this technology meets is a, is a fun uh space to be in because if we go and we get those quizzes from about the videos right using the ai then we can come here with this h5p and put those questions into the video so that as they're watching the video they're getting these questions that we're then 
uh, already generated from this thing watching the video. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Okay, so I need you to restate that for a second, Robert. You said if we've got the video in D2L and the students click on it and, and they're watching the video, how do we get the questions we've created into that? I think link? we were using, well, was it Cultura that did that or but well, we got rid of that, didn't we? Or does you, we have have, you, you now, I guess. Yeah, right. I would have to look, I would look, have to look on how to do it in Yuja. Um, okay. But it, so for instance, in LibreText, this is where my, uh, my textbook's built in to LibreText. It has like an H5P section yeah. in it allows me to do it there in the same way that Kaltura used to for, and I just haven't used UG yet. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't used that yet, but you you reminded me that I have to for my ed psych. So thank you for that comment. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, essentially, that would be how if Yuja allows for that insertion of questions over the top of the video while it's playing, you would you know, go send it to uh, the video to the AI and say, hey, generate a bunch of uh, multiple choice questions. Also, like Kirsten said, I would ask it for way too many because it's going to generate yeah. a few nonsense ones. So that yeah, if I want nonsense. if I want 10, I always ask for 30 or 40 oh, okay. and, and then I'll pick the 10 good ones mm -hmm. uh, out of it. Um, and then I would overlay those onto the video. So then as the students are watching it, pauses, ask the question. So then it's also ensuring that they watch the whole video too. They have to, because it's the only way they get all the questions. Um, and right, so that's I remember a, that about Cultura, yeah. yeah. It's they a fun way that all, all technology. On us. We gotta learn <laughs> new things all the time. That's true, okay. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it, like for brainstorming um, and then, you know, so you get like five answers and then I'll be like, OK, give me five more. And uh, and then you might think of, well, OK, if you if you consider this aspect, you know, it, it's all about iterations is what I've, I've been hearing over and over again as I've attended different workshops about how to use AI. Um, you know, it rarely is going to be exactly what you want up front. Although, as Robert's pointing out, the more specific role you can give it. So, you know, telling it who it is and who its audience is and the tone or the maybe the lexile level you want it to respond in, you know, like there are there are lots of things you can do to get it to shape its response. I was I was getting it to grade some journals um, and I was trying to see, uh, you know, if they could follow my rubric and what advice it would give if I said strengths and areas to improve. And I, you know, I had to keep tweaking, like, it's like, oh, it's not really what I would say. And I still haven't really figured out how to do it yet. But I did end up saying, ah, you need to change it to be personal, say you should, because it was giving a very general, you know, I don't know, one should or students should, and, and I wanted it to be more personalized. And that made a difference, right? Once it started writing, you should write complete sentences. Um, it was like, oh, that's much better. And so it is a, a, a series of getting closer to what it is that you want, but it can do tasks. Like I said, producing something that would take you a while. And especially if you already have one version and you want it in a, in a different format, that, that's where it can shine, I think, so far. That, that's how I've been able to. And I, I would add to that note, and again, this is at this point kind of impractical. Uh, it's more fun to play with, I suppose. But um, to speak to Kirsten's point, if I designed an AI specifically to say identify errors in film, mise en scene, et cetera, it needs to know all the technical knowledge. So I have one bot that just knows film. And then I teach another bot, this is how I talk to students. Mm -hmm. And then I teach another bot and this is how we write well. And then I filter it through all three that third response, that final response is going to be what I'm looking for. Ah, okay. I see what you're, what because you're each, doing. Okay. Each thing has like a specific task and a specific thing I wanted to do. So first it's going to pick out all the film errors. Then it's going to pick out all the grammar errors. And then it's going to put it into a personable tone that sounds like me and says what I wanted to say. Um, now, again, it's, it's impractical to have three bots and to put every single thing through three bots. Uh, 
this is like I said, is more <laughs> an intellectual exercise, I think, to like, but that's what that's how I've gotten it to generate something I thought was quality, is I gave it three different things to do. Um, right. and they were very specific. Huh which is kind of what you were getting at with iterations too. It was like, uh, instead of doing iterations, I, I kind of figured out what the iterations were and then pre-planned for them. Right. And with my paid subscription, I can see in the margin, it's kept track of my previous queries. So if I want to go back to last week's, hey, this is what I was doing with the journals last week. If I want to come back to it this week, I can click on it. And like, it's still got the memory of all the rubrics and stuff that I put in. I'm just now iterating again a week later on the same query. And if it were free, I wouldn't have the, you know, the memory rate of the stuff I've done previously. I will say having played with that, I have found that after a certain time, okay. after a certain number of responses, I have to reiterate. Yeah, okay. I have to, because it'll yeah. be, it'll like, it'll, it's around like six or seven responses. It'll completely forget the rubric from up here. And okay. I'll be like, did you, and, I'll, and, and I can even ask it, do you remember the rubric? And it'll go searching <laughs> knowledge. Oops, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, there is a, there, I, there does seem to be like a number of responses mm -hmm. removed. It can go from knowledge before it starts falling apart. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't know what the magic number okay. is, but. So Robert, how have you used it with students applying it directly? Uh, do you mean with um, like allowing my students to use it to create stuff? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, so so I far we're we're kind of talking about applying it to like like our side of our work mm -hmm. environment, but have you put it into your classes and had students um, not? Not yet. I haven't been that brave, I guess. Um, in that I have used it to show, I have used it to show them kind of what we were talking about in the beginning, how it doesn't work um, as a way of like sort of dissuading them. I do bring it, I show it to them. I'm like, look, ha try to make it respond. Let's find all the, th and like, here's what I'm looking for. Show me all the ways this thing failed. And then when they see how much it failed <laughs> and I'm like, look, it's not gonna matter. I don't care if you use AI you're gonna fail. Like, that's what I'm trying to tell you is like, it just will fail because it's not gonna do what I'm asking for. I just showed you it can't. Um, and so I've used it in that way. So uh, like, what, what did you do? Like, I'm curious, this, like, what did you do? What, like, what did you do with your students to, to show that it wasn't useful? So in my film class, we have to review short films, for instance. And so I'll give it a short film and be like, okay, well, here's the prompt, write a view for this short film. I'm like, or actually I have the students do it. So they tell it whatever, I, I'm just kind of paraphrasing. They'll give it, obviously they put my prompt in there and then they're like, oh, this is the video. I need to like respond this way. And then it'll respond with a bunch of vague garbled nonsense. It won't have any timestamps or the timestamps will be completely made up. Uh, sometimes with like, it'll be like minute 57 and it's a 15 minute video <laughs> and you're like, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, I just, I just, hey, go and use it for this assignment that you're actually going to have to do do later. And then we pick, and then I actually have them grade it uh, based on how uh, the rubrics, et cetera, we're going to use. And then I'll put it up on the board and grade it there as well. And they get to see, oh, well, it doesn't really matter if he knows if I used AI or not, because this is an F regardless. And that usually dissuades most people from trying from then on out. Um that's the only way I've used it so far. If in the future, how I would, how I think it could be used with students in sort of an ethical, useful way is uh, similar to what Kirsten was talking about for us, to be honest, is like, you know, if you take notes from my class, you wrote those in shorthand for yourself, right? Uh, maybe it doesn't make tons of sense or whatever. So I would give those notes to GBT and say, hey, organize these into a study guide. Right. That's, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect for that. Because right. it's your notes, it's your knowledge, and you're just saying, hey, put this in an organization that makes sense and that is easy to study. And then I, and then from that study guide, I can say, hey, give me flashcard questions. Again, perfect use of it. Um, so there's, there's lots of really effective ways that this could be used, especially if on the back end, we have gone and programmed them. So I, if I programmed them with like Cornell notes and my knowledge on how to create good study materials, and then I give it to them as something to help them produce study materials, I think that's a very effective way of using it. Now, how to go about that is uh, I'm still. <laughs> right. Thing. Well, I, was, I think I like that way of like actually showing them in the classroom 
um, how if they were to do something, then it wouldn't be graded well. So I mean, what's the purpose of doing it? It doesn't really fit what I'm what I'm looking for and, and my expectation. So I mean, and like, I, I think that then the way they realize is, oh, this is all this is is a last ditch effort because I didn't do anything. Yeah. And now I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to like, oh, I need something right now. And, you know, oh, that's just not the best way to pass a course, period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate your question, Lita, because I think that's where I'm trying to go with it, too. You know, I teach future teachers, so I'm trying to get them to, you know, use the tools that are available to educators. So I kind of feel like I have to teach them something about AI, because yeah. I know it's it's going to be, you know, not only are they using it now as students, but it's going to be expected probably, you know, just like calculators and, you know, other educational tools. But of course, the ethical use, right, the appropriate right. use, you know, how can you use this truly for good and in the way it's intended and that's what I'm trying to develop. And I'm certainly not there. I might be 10% of the way in my mind about how to go about doing that. I don't know what the assessment should look like or what the practice should look like, but I do know that I need to add something in my course that addresses specifically how to use this tool as a student. As a learner. As a student, as a learner. How to use how the tool you as use a it? learner in an ethical way. Yes, uh, we're, we're, we're learning the professional side of using the tool to make our job easier, more efficient and smooth and like mm -hmm. kind of tap down some of our brainstorming and just be more efficient in our process and maybe come up with something that we hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. But as a learner, when they're still <laughs> building knowledge, not to use that to replace their learning. That's what's happening. That's the, that's the struggle. That's and that honestly, that's why I've, I've kind of back. I have not tried putting it in a classroom because that's the thing that I don't. Yeah, that's yeah. And that they they in the same way that we've replaced using or understanding maps with Google Maps, and that no one could find right. their way anywhere anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's just obviously not going to be effective long term. And so I don't. Yeah, that's the ethics question that I'm kind of. I don't know the answer to. And uh, yeah, I think that's the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on a positive note, though, since we're talking about how AI could change lives, this is the story I like to tell my students when we talk about this, because we often hear about robots and AI taking jobs away from people. You know, all, all our jobs are going to go away, et cetera. Horror stories. This is the place I take my students for my Tokyo and film course. And all these robots are run by AI that are sorry are powered by ai but run by people who are paraplegic or otherwise unable to they would not be able to have a job essentially without this and now through these robots they're here serving craft they're you know, bartenders cafe uh owners they're baristas and each one of these robots on the table light up most of them speak english even pretty well uh and so here's a place where with AI and technology, we're giving people jobs and a quality of life that didn't otherwise have it. So it's not all doom and gloom, I don't think. It's yeah. really about how we apply it. Mm -hmm. And there's some positive stories out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly it's in the workplace. You know, people use it um, a lot to make make their jobs more efficient and smoother and easier. So they're going to be getting to that place when they graduate. So got to learn about the proper usage. Yeah, I think it's a disservice if we just try to say, I'm not going to use AI. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to let my students use it in any way, shape or form. Because um, I think it is the, a future tool in so many different areas of career paths that we we have to find a way to incorporate it and teach them how to use it and like i say ethically you know <laughs> this is what you should be doing and of course i mean there that is 
all there are lots of tools already. Somebody said this the other other day, right? Um, they don't need Chat GPT to cheat, right? All they need is a, a hat or their arm or a slip of paper, and they've been doing that for centuries, right? So, so if people really want to use a way to take a shortcut, they they'll find a tool, and they don't need you know AI to do that. It's just yet another tool that they could use, and I know. It's even harder maybe for us to monitor for those things, but how do how do we keep them from trying to take the shortcut, right? Like how do we incentivize the right and appropriate use of AI? Um, and I think that there's something we can do in the design of our course and how we're asking them to use it and how we're teaching them to use it that, you know, can get that message across, I hope. But, you know, some people are going to cheat no matter what you do. <laughs> I mean, they're just... That's just human nature, right? There's a percentage who are, are always looking for the fast buck and the easy way. I mean, in some sense, I think AI is a sort of natural answer to the internet. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is the internet, uh, I think, changed the landscape of education. I think in yeah. some ways we're just now figuring that out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, uh, in that, like, uh, like, they don't need us for knowledge anymore. All the knowledge, like, it's all right here for me. I don't need anyone to teach me like a fact I can find the fact uh it's it's all there for me right now at my fingertips and that changed how education was done because before we were like this arbiter of knowledge that they needed us to tell them exactly what was right and they don't need that anymore but what the internet did do is it gave it was like this there's so much there's so much information that you can't even tell what's true anymore um, for a lot of people, uh, it's like, how do I parse all the information in the world all at once? And to some extent, AI is an answer. to that. It's like, here is my research buddy who can instantaneously sift through 30 articles at once and say, mm, some of that was inconsistent. <laughs> um, so that's how I see it is like, to me, it's, it's kind of a natural growth and a natural evolution in a way that we are going to now refine that information. Because we've had we we had it all dumped on us, and it was I think too much for our brains to handle. <laughs> and uh, this is like a natural way to have something there to say, okay, well that there's everything. This is what I need. Help me find it. And uh, and for that, it works pretty well. Yeah, our brains were not designed to handle this pace or this maximal right. number of you know new inputs all the time right it's just overwhelming that's just not the environment we we've existed in up until the last decade so yeah and I, would, and I would also point out that the knowledge that it can find isn't even just knowledge out there it's also knowledge in us too so like for instance if i give a good well-designed ai algorithm quiz to a student that sit there and picks up all of its all of that student's uh, little mistakes and nuances that they are specifically making. So maybe some person just really loves comma splices. It's going to learn that about that specific student, about their specific needs, and it's going to just keep refining it. And it's going to learn that student in a way that I never could in a class full of 25 students. It just, I just can't. And um, so then the feedback that is providing that student on grammar is going to be light years ahead of what I could do. Um, I think the student deserves that, especially if it can, especially when we think of like remedial or bringing people up to the levels they need to be, if the, if we can shorten that and make it so much more specialized and so much easier for them to do without shame, et cetera, having to sit around and, you know, be in remedial classes where they could, you know, specifically get, okay, this is what you need help with. Here it is refined, practice it. And now you're at the level that we need there that you need to be for this class. It seems um, like the challenge there would be, um, you know, fighting the laziness to just say, I don't really need to learn my uh, downsides because I can just put this into, you know, a chat bot for the, or into AI for the rest of my my career. Yeah. And, and uh, having and the, the key is to encourage the students to want to improve themselves and be able to do it without that yeah. crutch in the future. You know, I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really the, the great. It can go two ways. It can be like, oh, I don't ever have to do anything again because this thing can do it. Or I can use it as a way of like, hey, show me all the ways to make myself better and it will and i'll be better yeah, um i, I so, think ai can make us much dumber as a society or it can make us much much smarter it just depends on 
on how it's applied, like you said. How it's applied, yeah. Yeah. That makes me wonder about the 24-7 drop-off tutoring. I wonder if it's AI. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is at this point. Drop-off papers? I've never tried it. I should maybe maybe uh, the professor should try <laughs> submitting. You no, know, because they get caught. They, I mean, we've gone through different programs, but um, I mean, when I used to see my students, you know, would have a person's name. Hi, I'm Sandy. But I wonder if it's an AI. If it's AI. Well, I well, there would be some serious ethical issues with that. Actually, now that I think about it, because can you imagine? I drop off my paper to the tutor that's provided. It gives me back notes. I submit that. It gets flagged for AI. And I get failed. Like, that would be a problem. Uh, I don't know the answer. These tutors are available 24-7 in drop-off mode. I just... I don't know. So Good question. Really there at two, <laughs> three o'clock to four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> uh, maybe it is that you can just drop it off 24-7. Not that they'll get to it 24 i don't know i don't, I don't know. know there's at least people. five o'clock somewhere anyway. right. isn't that what they say <laughs> outsourcing outsourcing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're different... just using night owls i do appreciate that about virtual work sometimes <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh technically this was till eleven fifty. I think uh if there's a, unless there's anything questions or things left over that you want to discuss, uh, go ahead and stop the recording there. <laughs>